Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. As we know, freeze damage has been the big story in Oklahoma wheat this spring. For an update, we want to visit with Jeff Edwards, our small grains extension specialist. And Jeff, give us an update on, on how things are since this last freeze about a week and a half ago. Well, the, the last freeze certainly was uh, not something we normally experienced to have a freeze that late in, in April. In southwestern Oklahoma, most of that crop was already, uh, the freeze damage was already extensive in that part of the state. So this additional freeze injury maybe caused a little bit of additional injury, but uh, uh, the crop was already hit pretty hard. In central Oklahoma, we have some injury, uh, but it's not extensive. Uh, I don't think we have many complete losses due to freeze injury. We did have a couple of hail storms that came through and we have fields that are complete losses due to, due to hail injury. This last freeze where it really hit was in the panhandle of Oklahoma. Uh, in Cimarron County, a lot of that crop, if it was not irrigated, it was already lost due to drought. As you move into Texas and Beaver counties, we were on our way to a decent crop, even in the dry land acres, and the freeze in, freeze hit those acres very hard, and uh, the damage was extensive, and it's questionable how much wheat we're actually going to cut in the Oklahoma Panhandle this year because of the freeze. Okay, pretty rough year for a lot of farmers out there. It, it, it is. We, uh, you name it, and we've experienced it this year with drought, freeze, hail. Uh, it's, it's just been a really tough year all the way around. Okay, we're about a month out from the projected start of harvest. Um, what kind of concerns, if any, do you have about disease this year? We have some foliar disease out there. We had quite a bit of powdery mildew early. We've had stripe rust in the state, uh, maybe a little bit of leaf rust, but nothing has really exploded. Uh, for the past couple of years, we've had stripe rust that has just exploded in the state, and it just hasn't happened this year. Uh, so it's not going to be a major factor this year. I don't think that it will be. For growers who are planning to make a foliar fungicide application, we are nearing the end of that window. Most of our foliar fungicides are on label until growth stage 10.5, which would be 50% of the crop at flowering stage. Most of our, our wheat fields, at least in central Oklahoma, are completely flowered. Uh, so that takes most of our fungicides off the table. The ones that are still left on the table at that stage have a 30-day or perhaps more uh, pre-harvest interval for application. And as you mentioned, we are pretty close to within 30 days of harvest. So that, that window is closing uh, very quickly. Okay, give us an idea of the weed picture this year. Not as bad, you say, because of a widespread drought? <laughs> it, is, it was so dry this year that even weeds had trouble emerging. So it's, it hasn't been that bad of a year in terms of, of weeds. What I would encourage producers to do if they do have weeds present would be to go out in their fields and kind of make a weed map. We have some weeds such as cheat uh, and rescue grass would be two examples that at the seedling stage are very difficult to distinguish. One of those, cheat, we can control very effectively. Rescue grass, we don't have any herbicides that are very effective on rescue grass. So if you go out there now when they're heading out, make a weed map and make note of what weeds you have and where they are, it will help you out this fall in making those herbicide decisions. And also, if you have some weeds such as feral rye that are very difficult to control, it will help you make decisions on how to get a handle on, on weeds such as that. Okay, and one option, of course, is always crop rotation. When we talk about things such as feral rye, really any weed that we're dealing with, crop rotation is always the most effective option. It's going to increase yields uh, in wheat in subsequent years. It's going to take care of the, the weed problems. And my, my favorite crop rotation for most producers in Oklahoma is, is canola because of the way it fits into our system. Another option, if you're locked into weed and, and can't go with crop rotation, we have some two gene uh, clear field varieties out there now that will allow you to, uh, to work on those feral rye problems more effectively than the one gene varieties would. With the two gene varieties, we use the same rate, same chemical, but we add a methylated seed oil into the tank. 
Uh, it, it penetrates the cuticle of the fer feral rye plant and gets more herbicide into the plant and is more effective at controlling feral rye. Uh, so with our two gene varieties, we have that option and uh, can work a lot harder on those feral rye infestations. Okay, and we can expect to hear more about those in the, in the weeks and months ahead? We can. There are uh, several things in, in the works in terms of two gene clear field varieties. We have a few in the variety trial this year. Uh, you're going to see more of those in coming years. Okay, Jeff Edwards, our Small Grains Extension Specialist, and we'll see you again soon. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. Our weather finally caught up with the calendar. This really jumps out by looking at a chart of air temperatures from last Thursday, May 2nd, through Wednesday, May 8th for Woodward, Oklahoma City West, and Durant. From last Thursday, May 2nd, through Sunday, May 5th, the daily highs for these widespread locations came in below 70 degrees. The lows for Woodward, Oklahoma City West, and Durant for these early days in May stayed below 40 degrees, climbed slowly into the 40 to 50 degree range, finally climbing into the 50s Tuesday, May 7th. Wednesday, May 8th, all three sites had highs over 80 degrees. Checking the plant available water from the soil surface down to 32 inches shows three main colored areas across the state. The dark brown areas are starting out the summer growing season with little moisture, less than one inch of water in 32 inches of soil. The yellow colored areas are in better shape with two to four inches of available water. The green areas are in great shape with five or more inches of water. Nowata has the highest plant available water, nine and 42 hundredths inches of water. Gary, how are things faring this May? Good morning, everybody. It's always great to be back on Sun Up. And as usual, we're gonna talk about the latest U.S. Drought Monitor map. So let's take a look at the improvements we've seen. We'll start with the good news. We see in East Central Oklahoma, we've just about gotten rid of all the colors over there, but in Western Oklahoma, especially Oklahoma Panhandle, we still see that significant drought in place. And we did see an increase in the amount of D4 or exceptional drought in the Panhandle. Um, and some of that's still, of course, in place across Western and, and Southwestern Oklahoma. So we still have lots of improvements to make across Western Oklahoma. As an example of what folks in the far Western Panhandle are going through, I want to show you this picture that was sent to me from Baca County, Colorado. Now this is just across the border to the north. And here you see a dust storm uh, in mid-April approaching from the north to the Oklahoma Panhandle. So, you know, this is a picture straight out of the Dust Bowl. It's been great that we're getting the relief across East Central, Eastern, and Central Oklahoma. But folks out west are still dealing with some pretty significant impacts. And so we really need to get that rainfall to shift to the west. Now let's zoom out and take a look at the wider picture on the U.S. Drought Monitor. As you can see from this national map, the drought has sort of switched characteristics in the past year. We've gone from a more central U.S. type of a drought from the Dakotas all the way down to Texas, and it's shifted farther to the west. So really, from the eastern sides of Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and the Dakotas, to the west of there, that's where the main body of the, the drought lies, and especially in the high plains of the United States. So as we've seen from the latest U.S. Drought Monitor report, we still need lots of rainfall across western parts of the state. It's fantastic that we've seen that relief in the eastern half of the state, but we have to remember what folks out west are going through. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Smartphones are changing everything, and agriculture is no exception. Here today to talk about one great new application for your smartphone in the field, Tom Royer, Extension Entomologist. Tom, let's talk about iWheat.org. Yes, iWheat.org is a uh, platform, almost like a social network kind of thing, uh, focused on wheat and wheat production. And uh, we, we got uh, a grant from the USDA several years ago to develop this platform. And it is designed to be a platform to work with for producers to use 
you know, use as a social network kind of all about wheat, anything about wheat. And one of the things that we're constantly asking um, as we're developing it, uh, we, we show it to producers and say, what do you want for this thing? So we're slowly adding things that we know producers and people that are involved in wheat production want so that this is a one-stop place that they can come and get any kind of information they need about wheat. All right, and one of the things, the tools it has right now is a way to sample your fields for some insects. Can you yes. tell us about that? Sure. Um, originally, we developed Glance and Go as a, sim a simpler way to uh, uh, sample for green bugs. iWheat's even made it simpler because it's all on a platform that we can access with our iPhone or, or a smartphone, and we can literally go out in the field and sample and punch in the things that we're, as we're finding them, into the iPhone, and it will shoot that stuff to a place if we want to share it. It'll shoot that stuff um, to a, a platform and make a map out of, you know, if there's green bugs happening in a certain area, it'll, it'll show, you know, on that map where they are if we choose to uh, sample it. If I want to have my own information, I have something called myiwheat.org that uh, is just the information that I have personally that I keep for myself and I can choose just like you would in Facebook or anything else to share some of it or not share okay. depending on what you want to do. Well let's, let's see how it samples it. Show okay. us the process. All right. It, it works just the same as Glance and Go. Um, I go to a spot in the field and then we'll just walk out here. I'll go to a spot and stop and then I'm required to uh, uh, pull up a tiller and examine it for green bugs and for mummies, okay. uh, the natural enemy. And so I just need to look at it. And if I find a green bug, for example, I can just punch the number where it says aphid and it will turn it green and um, say that you have an aphid. And then when I'm done with this stop, I just punch in continue and go to the next location and sample three more times. So now as we talk about the website, we're talking about green bugs and sampling, but now there are some reports in the news recently about some green bugs out there, maybe I guess in West Texas, yes. that are pesticide resistant. Yeah, they, uh, uh, a, a colleague of mine, another extension entomologist, Dr. Ed Bynum, uh, discovered at least six different counties where green bugs that are resistant to chlorpyrifos, which is a commonly used aphicide. Um, it's it's uh, one of the you know main products is Lorsban. It's also known as Lorsban, but there's a lot of other uh, generic compounds that has that active ingredient. This, uh, these green bugs are very resistant, up to 1,500 times res more resistant than the, than the dose um, that you would normally use. And, and so that's of concern because when you have a situation like that, and uh, if you're a producer and you have a green bug problem and you go out and spray your field and you have a failure of control, uh, it's just gonna allow, basically what you've done is taken out any natural enemies that were there which even frees up the green bugs more to be even more uh, able to increase in numbers. Right, now that's, that's in, in Texas there. Are we concerned here in Oklahoma about having that same problem? I, I have not received reports of that and I'm not concerned about it right now, but one thing that uh, I uh, like to stress all the time is I've noticed that we have a tendency now when we're spraying a field for um, weed control or something, to throw in a little insecticide in it, even whether we've scouted that field or decided there's a problem or not. Once you start doing that, that's a really good way to start selecting for uh, pests that are resistant to that particular insecticide. So um, I always like to try and encourage as much as possible, taking advantage of natural enemies that you already have out there and only really using insecticides when you know you need them. Um, it's, it's an easy thing to do to say, gosh, I don't want to spend a little extra money for an extra trip if I have to go out and spray for a green bug problem, but right. dang it, if they're not there, why spray for them? Absolutely. Yeah. All right, good information. As always, Tom Royer, Extension Entomologist here at Oklahoma State University. One of the management strategies that we have for cow-calf operations that has a real chance to not only just be cost-effective, but quite frankly profitable, is deworming of the cattle, especially in the early summer uh, as we go into the, the summer grazing season. 
Here at Oklahoma State University, we did a considerable number of trials on deworming strategies in cow-calf operations. We uh, actually conducted the experiments in eastern Oklahoma on some improved pastures that were really quite lush, well-maintained, and in years where we had adequate rainfall. What we looked at was comparing deworming the cow only, deworming the calf only, or deworming both the cow and the calf. And these were done about the first week of June on springborn calves. What we found was that if we dewormed the cow only, there was only an increase in weaning weights of the calf of about 15 pounds. If we dewormed the calf only, we got quite a considerable increase. And the weaning weight increase was 21 pounds for deworming the calf only. We got another four pounds increase in weaning weight by deworming both the cow and the calf. Now again, I wanna stress that in this situation, there was adequate nutrition for those cattle and the cows were in excellent body condition. So we saw no particular advantage from the deworming of the cow in terms of cow performance. That might be a different situation for your operation if we've got some thinner cows going into this summertime period on some very, very short pastures. We might see a response from deworming in terms of cow performance. If we're going to utilize the deworming strategy for the, the best use of our dollar for the outcome, certainly I would stress deworming that calf. That's the one that looks like in terms of getting the most money back in weaning weights of the calves for the amount of money that we spend on deworming product, that that's the, the best uh, bang for our buck. We hope you'll consider this as you go into uh, this summer grazing season and get the advantage of deworming those calves in, in terms of getting a little heavier calf at weaning time for a relatively few dollars spent. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunups Cow Calf Corner. There's an animal that may be living on your tree right now that may be causing a lot of damage, but you won't know about it until fall. And we're here to talk with Craig McKinley about that nematode. What is a nematode? Well, we're talking about the pine wood nematode. Right. Uh, the uh, pine wood nematode is a small microscopic animal that lives in trees. Uh, it reproduces in trees and also destroys the water conducting system of those trees. Wow, and is this something that somebody were to walk up to the tree, would they be able to see it? They probably wouldn't. Usually the first symptom is the fact that the tree died very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, some people describe it as overnight. It's not quite that fast, right. but it seems like it. Okay, so this, this is a, a microscopic animal that's living on the tree that causes it to die later in the season, right? It generally occurs after the trees have undergone stress. In Oklahoma, that's usually late August, early September primarily after we've had a long, hot summer. Okay, and, and we were talking off camera, the nematodes actually travel on, on an insect. It does, it, it's vectored, mm -hmm. and that's the term, uh, from one tree to another by the pine sawyer beetle. Mm -hmm. And you may know these, they have the very long antenna. You'll mm -hmm. see sometimes called the longhorn beetle. Okay, is, is there anything that producers can be looking at in their trees right now to, to see if they have them? Really not, uh, again, uh, in order to test for the nematode, you'd have to destroy the tree, so okay. we don't want to do that. Obviously, as the tree dies, then uh, sections can be taken and we can confirm that that was the cause of death. Okay, and, and is there anything that producers can be doing to, to spray for them right now? Well, you really can't spray for them uh, because these beetles essentially are everywhere. Right. But I think the important thing is to try to prevent the stress on the tree. Okay. And one of those ways, of course, through the, the long, hot summer is by irrigating uh, those trees at frequent intervals. Okay, and, and, and there's no magic number, the tree should have this much water, it's just as it looks stressed, you should water it? Well, my general rule of thumb is a tree should get two inches of water every two weeks. Oh really, okay. Not, not one inch a week, but two inches every two weeks, and that allows the soil to dry out and then become resaturated. Okay, and, and it shouldn't be two inches over two weeks, it should be two inches at a time? At a time, right. really. Okay. Yeah, so then it, the water can, can dissipate, the tree can adapt, and then in a sense be ready for the next uh, irrigation. So if, if, if our pine tree has nematodes in it right now, what should we be doing to prevent it? 
from going on to the next pine tree. If in fact you see that you've got nematodes, the best thing to do is cut that tree down and dispose of it, such as burning, in order to rid the tree of any pine sawyer beetles that might be in there at this time. But once it's uh, nematodes are in the tree, there's really nothing you can do. Okay, well that's too bad for trees that, that get that in Oklahoma. I would I would point out that it quite often is Austrian and Scots pine. Okay. And those are the two most susceptible species that we have. Okay, thank you very much, Craig McKinley with yeah. Oklahoma State University. Kim Anderson, our grain marketing specialist, joins us now. Kim, we talk about prices every week, but to truly understand the markets, it's important to sometimes get some historical perspective. So let's start with that. And yeah, we need to go back about five years when we had a definite shift in the markets. Uh, so we'll start at June 2008 and, and come through present. If you, we're going to use Medford, Oklahoma cash, daily cash prices. And if you'll look at the average cash price, it was $6.40 over the last five years. If you look at each day, an average daily move, average is 11 and a half cents per day, and the maximum daily change was 64 cents. Okay, we're gearing up toward harvest, of course, in Oklahoma. Let's look at the history of harvest pricing. Okay, just looking at June prices, the monthly average prices, if you go back to uh, 2008, the average price in June was $8.19, but the range in prices was a $1.67 range from $7.22 to $8.89. If you go to 2009, the average price was $5.84, and the range was from $5.24 to $6.67, a dollar and 43 cent price move just in the month of June. 2010, prices were in the tank, $3.69 average, 339 to 391, only a 52 cent monthly price move. 2011, 787, range of a dollar and 87 cents from 671 to 869. And then of course last year, average price is 642 with a range of 599 to 716, a dollar and 17 cent price move. Okay, with these numbers in mind and this perspective, how should producers then sell their wheat? I think it's a clear strategy that you don't sell it all at once, that you stagger it throughout the market. So what you've got to do is sell it over time, third, third, and a third. Okay, that sums it up. Kim Anderson, thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. Uh, a lot of times after many of our land management practices that we do, a lot of clearings, either cutting cedar trees mechanically, clearing areas and doing that, we end up with brush piles. And brush piles are always problematic. Uh, if we look at the statistics for the southeastern U.S. at the cause of wildfires, typically 60, over 60% 60 of all the wildfires that are caused in the southeastern U.S. are caused by brush pile burning. And so they're a big problem. And so kind of what I want to talk to you about was when is the best time of the year to burn brush piles and how can we do it safely and not cause such a problem? Uh, you know, a lot of times people think that the best time to burn a brush pile is when it snows and we have snow on the ground. But as we know here in Oklahoma, most of the time our snow just doesn't last very long and typically it's gone in a day or two. You know, we may go out and light the brush pile when it's snowing or right after it's snowed. And that brush pile continues to burn for several days, even weeks after you've lit it off and that snow's gone. And once that snow goes, leaves, the, the dry vegetation around it dries out pretty quickly and is flammable. And a lot of times once you get a big strong front coming through with high winds, blows those embers from that pile around and next thing you know, you've got an escape fire from that brush pile. The best time of year that we have found to burn brush piles is typically late April, May, and June, whenever stuff starts to really green up. Because when stuff starts to green up in that time of year, we typically have lower incidence of wildfire, less chances of spot fires and escapes because of the green vegetation. Not saying that things will not burn, but they typically burn a lot slower and it takes more heat to get something to, to, to burn. So things to think about when you burn brush piles are what is the weather gonna be like today that you're gonna burn them? Is, are the winds strong or is there any chance of a front coming through 
Then you also need to check the weather for the next day or the following couple of days to see what's coming because if there's going to be a big change in the weather with strong winds coming and predicted, I wouldn't burn those brush piles. It's good to have some type of fire suppression equipment available. So if you do have a problem, you can readily attack it, put it out. So with any type of fire that you do, call the local fire department just to let them know. That's just a good common courtesy and a common practice. Call your neighbors, let them know what you're doing. Also, a couple of things that you might want to think about to control the intensity of your fire that you're going to have a brush pile. You may have a large brush pile with a lot of dried cedars that are going to be really flammable. You want to go to the downwind side of that brush pile and start your fire there. That way you're creating kind of a backfire through that brush pile where the fire is going to back slowly through that brush fire, reduce the intensity, the flame lengths, and probably the, chance, the probability of escapes happening. Whereas if you would go to the upwind side of it and light it, it's going to create a big head fire and engulf that brush pile a lot quicker and burn it up. And those are just some of the guidelines to help you have a safe brush pile burn. That does it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime on our website, sunup.okstate.edu. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a nice week, everyone, and a happy Mother's Day. And we'll see you next time at SUNUP. Thank you.